Hey, and we're live. Happy New Year. Happy 2018. Hey, Levi, how are you? Good. Year? Happy New Year to you, Rob. I haven't seen you since last year. <laughs> Had to get that dad joke out of the way. Um, so yeah, we're we're here in January. It's very winter here in New Hampshire. Uh, we just had a we've had like a two week long cold snap through with a few big snowstorms oh, thrown in, and uh, it's actually we're excited that today because it actually might it might almost get up to thirty degrees today. So that's holy pretty, cow, pretty warm. Um, so so I, I woke up early and went hiking this morning here, and <laughs> it was it was forty degrees at six thirty a.m. So I, I remember that. I remember <laughs> forty degrees. Well, it's good to see you and. Um, our topic this this month is black and white, uh, which seems fitting because when I look out my window right now, that's pretty much all I see. Everything <laughs> is pretty much black and white. Right. Um, and we have a special guest that you know. I, I've I've not met uh, Jim before, but you you know Jim, and you can talk about maybe where where you've met. But uh, Jim Walensky is here from Chicago, right? That's right. Yes, from the Windy City. Um, Jim, how how you doing? It's cold here. <laughs> that's yes. yeah. Of course, it's you were just cold. on the beach. So that, I that, was in Sandia in La Jolla, yeah, two days ago yeah. on the beach. That exaggerates and things. Shoes on, sure. And yeah, it was it was rough. That makes a big contrast. Um, so I was watching the temperature while I was gone, and you know, I saw minus ten. <laughs> and so, I felt I felt for everybody, but not too bad. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> so when you're when you're back home in Chicago, what do you what do you do there? Uh, I teach photography. Um, oh. I. I'm an instructor at uh, Chicago Photography Classes, and we've been around 47 years, I think. Okay. So I teach Photoshop. And it's so fun. And I'm, I'm just going to pitch it right now. That's in June, right? Yeah. It's in June. Yeah. The, the week after Father's Day, typically. Yeah. My birthday and, weekend. Uh, I always have something on there. I really want to go because, so like I wanted to go, I think it was last year. It was the 30th. It like came along with the 30th re year anniversary of first Bueller's Day Off. Yes, that would be perfect, right? Yeah. I when I was thirty years ago, when I was in, I was actually stationed outside of Chicago. I saw Ferris Bueller in Chicago in the theater, and I thought it'd be <laughs> so cool to come back and see it thirty years later. But I had, I had other plans. So that I, love, I love Chicago. I love Chicago. Yeah, no, every, everybody ought to check it out. Out of Chicago. dot com. And June is better than January. June is better than January. In fact, it's always good weather that weekend. We usually get some afternoon thunderstorms that make for great skies and there's fireworks every night and there's hot dogs and there's deep dish pizza. <laughs> you know, I just have to say that um, Chicago in the summertime, honestly, it's the greatest place in the world. There's no place that I'd rather be than Chicago. Yeah. So I can't say that, the but I would, the there's no place I'd rather be that weekend. <laughs> All right. All right. So <laughs> we, we, um, we have a couple things to give away at the end before we before we dive all the way in here. Uh, so, Levi, what are we giving away this time? Oh uh, yeah, we've got a couple of a uh, couple of good things. We've got Perfectly Clear from Perfectly Clear from Athentech, and it's a terrific tool for helping your pictures look better. Um, in fact, there's even some new black and white presets in there, so ah. we'll check those out maybe. And um, and then we've also got a terrific giveaway going on at PhotoFocus.com right now. If you head over there. And click on the side banner, you will see a raffle for a um, true life acrylic face mounted print. And it is the best way to present any kind of photograph. It yeah. is the, the sharpness is incredible. And then so there's there's acrylic prints, which are just beautiful. They have this luminosity that you just don't get from any other medium. But the true life acrylic is more luminous. That it's more transparent and it's it's more protective and it's less Ooh. reflective. It's uh, just it's yeah, that's a great the, the reflective piece. Though. That's yeah, yeah. So when you're standing there with the window behind you looking at your picture, you can see your picture instead of seeing the window behind you cool. reflected on the on the. And that's just go to photofocus.com and you click a button and you do, you just enter as well. Right. Yeah. It's it's a free raffle. Yeah. There, and besides that, we're giving away uh, on one photo raw as well as a consultation with me before we print your enormous photograph. Up to, so it's a 30 by 40 print. Oh, it's a 30 getting. by 40? Wow, it's not like yeah, a little, little 4 by 6 stuff. or something. Eh? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really a good deal. Awesome. If you said to me, if, if you brought a really good looking photograph, basically if you brought any of Jim's photographs to me and said, how should I present this? I would say, 
order a true life acrylic print. And so you can do you can do black and white too with this. It's not you can absolutely do black and white. And the thing about it too is that it's um it's it's photographic paper mounted to this acrylic face. And so it's not it's not like a metal print where you're um, where they're using like a, a a a transfer print that has less um, less tonal values, like a a photographic print that's printed on photo paper has tonal values that are just incredible. The gradation between white to black is is just incredible, and and then the the reflectance, the luminance of the paper. It's anyway, I could go on. All right, All right so, so I'm sold. Uh, uh, where do I sign up? Yeah, can I, yeah can you, can the the yeah, you can head over there. You can absolutely enter the raffle. Can, man, I really, that sounds <laughs> yeah. great. If you, if oh. I can get an acrylic yeah. print that doesn't reflect, I'm all over that. Yeah. That's... Oh, man. Well, and it's a it's a Chicago, I'll have to introduce you, Jim. Oh, cool. It's all right, so, too, so. so the way to get entered in the raffle is to go to Photo Focus, but to get the perfectly clear, you just have to leave us a comment, a question. You just need to leave us a comment, like Ed Vasco or Susan Nelson or Terry Dashfield or... Paula Wemelli. <laughs> so that's over on the on the YouTube page. Um, exactly. so if you're watching this embedded on, on Photo Focus, click the link to go over to YouTube so you can access the chat window there and, and just chime in, say hello, happy new year. But we love questions. So definitely love questions. Uh, questions about what Jim's gonna be showing us, questions about photography in general, black and white in general, whatever. So we just love to hear. So throw them all Can out. I just uh, jump in here and yeah. give a shout? I just want to give a shout out to On One. I'm I'm a creative consultant for On One too, and I just want and since you're giving uh, Photo Raw yeah, away, I just say that you know Photo Raw 2018 is a great product. I mean it's uh, it it's it's an all in one product. The effects modules is uh, terrific, and um, it's really easy to use. I love it. And the guys over at On One are great people, so I can't Absolutely. say enough about that product. So yeah, cool. That's great. All right. Yeah. Uh, so, now, sorry, Rob, real quick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jim's going to be showing us a lot of stuff in Photoshop and 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 on software. This is recorded right now, so as soon as we hang up and stop broadcasting, you can rewatch stuff. So we're not going to ask Jim to. Re repeat the things that he's done because you can go back and watch it in slow motion and press pause and, and try <laughs> things. So uh, yeah. let me just, just give you that advice. Well, uh, Robert Carey already chimed in and said, Walensky has changed my black and white, can't get enough. So Excellent. Who is that? One of your fans, apparently. All Robert, right. this is Robert Carey, is that your dad? Oh, Robert, how are you? <laughs> yes, oh, I know who Robert is. <laughs> He's looking at my mom to sign on with different I'm names. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, no, that's thank awesome. You. Yeah, thanks, thanks for thanks for chiming in there too, and everyone else that has. So yeah, so we'll we'll be keeping an eye on those those comments. So right before we got online, we were talking uh, about this, about this broadcast and and software that we use. Obviously, we talked about Lightroom because that's pretty much what we you know talk about each month. But we were, at, we were asking Jim. So Jim was gonna is going to be showing us some stuff in Camera Raw and Photoshop. He teaches Photoshop, as he said. And we start talking about what are some of the criteria about why you would use one product over another. Not not to get into all of that, but it, it was, I don't know. Do you want you wanted to, you want us to hold that conversation, Levi? So do, where, where should we I, yeah, I mean, like you know, Jim uses a lot of different software. He he launches yeah. from Capture One. He uses Photoshop and and Photo Raw. And uh, well, Jim, you one interesting thing was that you were saying that you're not that worried about the cataloging power of Lightroom because you're 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 creating well I you know the thing high is, quality is the, photographs right I I'm I'm publishing maybe 20 photographs a year um, and although I do shoot a lot I'm very meticulous about how I organize things at the system level so you know I do do some cataloging but not a lot and so typically when I'm reaching for the Adobe um, raw converter, I'll just use Adobe Camera Raw because uh, you know, I'm, I'm right in Photoshop already. And yeah. Adobe Camera Raw, for those of you that don't know, is basically the develop module of Lightroom. It just looks different, right. but it's the same thing. The same tools are there and uh, I, it's just easier for me to use. As far as cataloging goes, I don't, I've never felt like I needed to, to really dive in and do that. 
Um, I don't have any trouble finding my images and I have 108,000 of them on my hard drive. So um, it's never been a problem for me because I'm careful about how I cat, how I organize at the system level. And I run into this all the time. I, um, when I'm teaching, I have people are, you know, pulling their hair out over the cataloging in Lightroom. And my question is, well, how many photographs are you working on? Well, you know, right. I'm just kind of doing it for myself and I don't have that much. Well, then you don't stress out over it. I think people feel like they have to do it because every, all of people like us say that, you know, the cataloging in Lightroom is so awesome and you should use it and it's great. And, you know, Rob, you were saying that you couldn't imagine living without it because it, you use the cataloging, um, even though you don't publish a lot of photos every year. So I don't know, I guess it's just a choice, but. Well, um, I think, I think it, it all comes down to being organized is really important, <laughs> you know, so you're yeah, doing yeah, it already. That's really, no matter if you're using Lightroom or not, it, Lightroom is not going to make your bad habits go away. <laughs> it's, it's not going to magically organize your stuff. You've, you've got you've to know how to use the tool. and you, So you know how to use your operating system's file browser or bridge or whatever. So you're using that and you're staying organized. That's awesome. That's, that's really the goal. Um, I still, my, if, I, if I threw Lightroom out the window now, my files are, are organized the way I want them. It's not mm -hmm. dependent on Lightroom. Right. Uh, for how they're organized on my system. But I do enjoy the benefits of being able to access all of them kind of at once uh, and, and, and to leverage some of those uh, functionalities of the catalog, like creating collections or sharing things through the Lightroom, was Lightroom Mobile, now Lightroom CC. Yeah, there's, there's definitely other benefits that I get from, from using that. But, but absolutely, and this is, what I've been helping people with with Lightroom for the last ten years is that organizational piece that really comes from you, comes from you, and that has to that has to be present. So, yeah, and I don't know, maybe I'm comfortable with it because I come from you know digital video. Uh, I used to edit digital video professionally, and I was doing it when that whole digital revolution was happening, and we didn't have those kind of organizing tools like Lightroom. So you had to develop right. a file system that worked. So yeah. maybe that's my yeah. correct. Well. It's it's. I wish everyone had because it's a lot of people kind of skip that. <laughs> skip that step. Yeah. So, Be organized. Um. So a question that came up, I saw uh, Jim. People are asking where they can find your videos, and I just want to point out. I mean, you can say it, but in Jim, when Jim's face pops up, there's his name, and underneath that is his website. Yeah. So my website is uh, alteredspacephoto.com, and uh, you can find me on YouTube as well. Just type my name in, and the channel will come up. So there's a bunch of. Okay. So just Jim Wilnitsky on YouTube. Either that or altered space, one or the other. Oh, so okay. and they'll both point to the same place. So, whatever. All right, is. so let's uh, let's take that as a jumping out point to get into this black and white stuff. So, if you were just talking to someone who wanted to start doing black and white, someone who even like me, who just kind of came in to photography at the digital stage, they didn't have a whole history of black and white film to fall back on, um, but now they're kind of hooked and they want to delve into black and white, how do you, what can you tell them to help them get started for both like the capturing, you know, what do you look for when you're capturing something that you're, you're visualizing for black and white before you even get to the part of, of making that conversion? So I think the important thing for black and white as far as shooting is that composition matters more than ever because you don't have color to rely on. So typically, I'm looking for shapes, um, combinations of shapes that work together, tones that work together. The other thing that's really important is learning to see in black and white, learning to visualize a scene in black and white. You can have things right next to each other that are different colors, but when you strip the color out, they look the same because mm. the luminance value, the brightness of those things is the same. So we can control a lot of that, manipulate a lot of that with the black and white adjustment layer or the black and white sliders in Lightroom or in, um, in Photo Raw. But if you set yourself up for success in the beginning, then you know, you're more likely to get there. So those are really the two big things hmm. to think about when you're capturing. When you're, um, when you're processing your photos, and my friend Blake Rudis says that, you know, he sees a lot of black and white that's not black and white. It's a lot of gray. That's really true. It's right. important 
to have some tones in your photo that are white and some that are black. And the gray tones in the middle, the mid-tones, have to have good distribution and good separation in order for the photo to work. If you look at the masters of black and white photography, you know, Robert Frank and Ansel Adams and the like, you'll see fantastic tonal distribution, just great control over the mid-tones. And that's, that's really important. But a good high contrast, um, uh, high contrast between your blacks and your whites is also important. You don't want the whole photo to be black or the whole photo to be white. And then the final thing when you're processing is to really watch your whites and your blacks. Um, and when I say the whites and the blacks, I mean the stuff that's really to the right on the histogram and that's really to the left on the histogram. Choose what you want to be black and leave a little detail in some of those darker areas so that your viewer has some context. Otherwise, when you print or when you show your image, you're just going to have this big blotch of nothing. And, you know, that that's kind of the sign of a black and white photograph that's not very well done. So okay. context is everything. Right. Yeah. Now, do you ever shoot, now I'm assuming, do you shoot raw? You know, I do. Now, do you ever shoot in, in a black and white mode on your camera while you're, or you do just stay in a color? I, I actually do sometimes. Um, yeah. And a perfect example of that is pet this past week, I was um, in La Jolla, at the, what's the name of that foundation? Oh, I forget. Um, it'll come to me in a minute. And I was shooting with a lens baby and I wanted to see what the photos would look like in black and white. And sometimes when I do that, it changes the way I think, it changes the yep. way I perceive things. So I think that's a valuable thing to do hmm. is, to, uh, is to shoot in black and white. Now, the thing to remember when you do that is that it's a basic JPEG conversion, right? And it's an 8-bit conversion. It's not going to be anything resembling what you're going to get at the end, but it gives you a good idea of what your composition looks like. Do the shapes work together? Do the lines work together? Does the photograph move all in the same way? Is it confused or is it not? Mm -hmm. And um, as with any style of photography, simplification is really important. The simpler you can make your composition, the better off you're going to be. So I do find that a valuable. Well, idea. If you, Unfortunately, if you, right. No, as, as Rob was about to say, if you're shooting in raw, you still get the color photograph when you're done. Absolutely. So, right. uh, yeah. You're, or right. raw plus JPEG is a, is a fun way to shoot right. when using black and white mode. Um, are you using a mirrorless camera? I am not. Yeah. I am okay. using a, I have a Nikon D600 and a D800. And those are my main cameras. Excellent. So. Okay. I'm starting the reason I ask is because if you're using a mirrorless camera and you switch to black and white mode while you're making the pictures, you see black and white as you're looking through the viewfinder. Right. Which is cool. Yeah. Well, you, if oh, you're yeah, shooting in live view, you'll see that too. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, so, I don't know. Now, wait a minute. Let, let me, let, let, let's talk about that for a second. Um, I think it might be valuable to see both at the same time, both color and black and white. Because yeah. you're forced to kind of make the the mental jump to black and white if you're doing that while you're shooting. You're seeing it in color, you see it in the viewfinder in color, and you click and then you look and you can see how those colors translate to black and white. And uh, the hurdle there that I think you might overcome by doing it is the idea of different colors being of equal luminance, of equal brightness that are next to each other. And you can't really tell that when you're seeing it in color, but when you see it in black and white, and then you can train your mind to make that transition. So that yeah, might be valuable. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good exercise. I'm gonna try that. Absolutely. Cool. All right, so let's say we've, we've got some photos captured and now what's kind of, what's your work, general workflow for getting started with that? Okay, so uh, I always end up in Photoshop and I'm, that's my tool of choice. I've been using it forever. So I think the most important thing to get out of your raw converter is a file that has good representation of all of your tones. In other words, nothing that's even close to being crushed on the low end, nothing that's even close to being blown out on the high end. 
and a, uh, a good representation of the contrast, relative contrast in your photo, in your file, and then a low contrast version of it. And the reason you want a low contrast version is because at least the way I teach black and white, we lighten and darken things a lot. Mm-hmm. And if you come in to Photoshop with a file that's already got a lot of tones in zones zero and one, you've got nowhere to go when you're processing. So a low contrast file is really important. It looks you know, not great when you bring it in, but it gives you the latitude that you need when you're processing. So that's the first thing. Um, then after that, uh, you know, it's spot removal because I have a D600 and anybody that knows anything about D600 <laughs> knows that that's a problem. Right. Yes, uh, I've, right. I've, I've had that problem. Right. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't sent my sensor in yet to, uh, or my camera in yet to have the shutter replaced, but uh, that's coming one of these days pretty soon. Yeah, so that was like a five years have, ago problem. Jim. That's why I have the 610 now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, because you sent yours in? No, I can still send it in. And I just kind yeah. of figured. I'll wait until the shutter count's really high and then basically. <laughs> That's good thinking. So just skip I've to become, the 850. Just, I've okay. become an expert at, uh, at spot Working removal. It. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. So spot removal, um, you know, perspective correction, if you need it, all those kinds of retouching things. And then uh, typically I'm going to go right to black and white. And I use a method of black and white conversion natively in Photoshop. I also use Silver Effects Pro and some other plugins, but today we're going to be talking about how to use the black, uh, the gradient map adjustment layer cool. it, coupled with the black and white adjustment layer. So w- essentially what you're doing is you're separating tone and color into two different layers and you have separate control over them. So it gives you a lot of latitude. And then from right there, on. it's, you know, curves and levels and Lots of other things that, you know, other toys, a glow or whatever to finish it off. Now, I, I will say that um, I feel like it's really important to at least have an idea where you're going before you start. So one of the things that I harp on my students all the time about is, um, you know, imagination and shooting from your imagination, shooting an idea rather than a thing. We go to the Eiffel Tower, for example, and if you just take a snapshot of the Eiffel Tower, it's going to be the same as the other zillion snapshots that are out there on the web. And nobody wants that. We all want our photographs to mean something. So find something about the Eiffel Tower that moves you. You know, it reminds me of this or it makes me feel like that. Shoot that. Shoot that instead of shooting a snapshot or a photo of the Eiffel Tower. And then take that idea and carry that all the way through your processing to the end. And then you're going to end up with something that's yours that no one else can produce because it came from inside you. Right. Excellent. Yeah. Well, hey, Jim, why don't you share your screen? And while you're getting that turned up, um, pa- Paula asks, is there an optimal time of day to shoot black and white? An optimal time of day? I would say um, any time of day really is a good day for black <laughs> and white. Uh, I mean, the, the know, same rules apply, like good light. Well, you know what? I you know. I actually like to shoot black and white a lot in flat light because I can relight the the Cuz you're going to contrast that. Okay. Yeah. I, it gives me a lot more freedom. I don't have shadows to deal with. I can I can do whatever I want and uh so typically especially if I'm shooting architecture, I'm looking for flat light and a good sky. Um don't be afraid to shoot black and white when uh, the sun is high in the sky in the middle mm-hmm. of the day because that high contrast light can be great for black and white. So Absolutely. really black and white gives you a lot of latitude and, you know, so many landscape photographers, rightfully so, stay away from the camera in the middle of the day because the light is crummy, but not for black and white. Mm. It's not crummy. It can be really great. So, yeah. Anytime. Especially in the city. Especially in the city. Oh, yeah. Because then what happens is the shadows actually become part of the composition. Right. They become another shape that you can incorporate into, you know, what it is that you're shooting. So, yeah, in the city, it's great. Absolutely awesome. great. Thanks. Can you see my screen? We can yes. see your screen. Okay. Take it away. All right. So um, we'll do this photo in a little bit. So I'm going to close this out. And I'm going to open. Let's see, let's start with this one. 
So this is a shot. I'm going to zero these settings out so that you can see what it is that I'm after when I'm shooting. This is a shot that was taken at Union Station in Kansas City. By the way, I went to visit my buddy Blake Brutus over the holiday, and uh, he lives just outside Kansas City. And I, I used to talk to him about Blake, what's Kansas City like? And he'd say, Oh, you know, it's 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 pretty cool, but it's not Chicago. And I got there, and and there were parts of the city that blew me away. So who Kansas City has this great, vibrant arts community and an awesome museum that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. But they also have this magnificent Union Station that is just, from an architectural standpoint, if you love architecture, you you need to go see this thing because it is massive and amazing. So you can see how small these people are in this shot. Yeah. So this Christmas tree is is there, and we shot this. This is like 10 o'clock at night we went in there so this this is a high iso handheld shot no tripod right um and i thought this might make an interesting black and white photo so the first thing that i'm going to do is go over into my lens correction um settings right always chromatic aberration and lens correction um and then we're going to come back over into the develop settings so what i'm after is good exposure and kind of flat tone so there's a couple ways I can go about this. I can goose the exposure a little bit if I want, which helps, or I could bring my shadows up. And in this case, because this is a high ISO shot, I'm gonna actually bring my exposure up. Because if I try to bring my shadows up, I'm just gonna get a ton of noise. Now my highlights are kind of blown out, so I'm gonna drop those back. So once they start to flatten out like that, um, you know, you want to bring them back a little bit so that you get some nice balance in there. And now I'll bring my shadows up just a touch, just like that. So if you look at my histogram, you can see that I've got nothing that's even close to the left or the right side and a fairly low contrast photo. Everything's kind of jammed together here. Mm -hmm. And we'll play with the contrast in Photoshop. Because this is a high ISO photo, we need to do some noise reduction on this thing. Can you can you see how noisy that really is? It's pretty bad. Yeah. It yeah, like it doesn't look terrible to us, but right. it, oh, there it goes. Yeah, it's getting yeah, getting kind of noisy. All right, so <laughs> you know how do you handle this? And the noise reduction in Lightroom is pretty darn good. So if I hold down the Alt key or the Option key on a Mac and just slide over to the right, now I'm going to lose the color, which is great because it's not a distraction for me. And I can just slide the luminance slider over to the right until I get rid of that noise and I let go. And you can see that that helps quite a bit if I just kind of go down here and turn this on and off. Hopefully you can see that. That's before and that's after. Now, of course, we've lost some detail. So I'm going to bring back some luminance detail here. But I'm not going to go overboard with this because if I do, I'm going to start to bring some of that texture from the noise back. So I'm just going to goose it a little bit. What I really want to do is do some sharpening. So the sharpening in light, in um, Camera Raw or Lightroom is also really good. But what I'm going to do is leave my radius down. And you can see that I've got my detail cranked all the way up. Radius down really low, right? And if I turn this all the way down, you can see that's nice and muddy, just the way that you would expect. But if I turn this up, I'm getting some sharpening, but not a lot of noise in there. And I can mitigate that even more with the masking slider. Just hold down the Alt or the Option key and drag this over to the right until those flat areas are kind of black. Now, only the stuff that's white is being sharpened. So now I can actually pump this up a little more and bring some of those edges back. So that's looking pretty good, right? So here's my before. Yay, that's terrible. Yeah. And yeah. here's my after, <laughs> and not bad. So, you know, it, uh, granted, I'm I'm zoomed in at 200%, but if I start to back out here, that's at 100%. That looks pretty good. That's, that's pretty acceptable um, for a shot that's, you know, I think I probably shot this at what? Uh, ISO 1600, so not bad. All right, 1600 so, on a on a D600. Yeah, on a D600. Man, that's not noisy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is to me. 
What do you you're, consider? You only, you only publish 20 pictures a year. I guess I, I publish about 20 pictures a day. So, well, there you go. <laughs> so I should be pickier. Um, so, you know, I'm happy with that. So this is what I'm going to bring into Photoshop, just like this. I actually might um, goose my exposure just a little more just to pull those shadows. Whoop, that's the sharpening slider. Um, just to pull those shadows up a little more. And I'll pull my highlights down a little more, just like that. So that's looking pretty good. Now, I'm doing black and white. So I'm not terribly worried about the white balance here, but I'm going to show you a cool trick in a second. So I'm going to just open this image in Photoshop just by clicking it there, and it's going to open up. So Hang on. This... I've, got a, I've got a question for you about that yeah. white balance then, because you're talking about the you, – you were just talking to us about the different luminance of different colors, and that can be hold significantly that, altered that, with white balance. Hold that thought. Okay. <laughs> hold that thought. I'm going to make a copy of this layer here. And I'm going to go up into the image menu, into these adjustments up here. This is nobody ever spends any time up here, and there's some awesome stuff up here. So I'm going to grab the match uh, color. And you see this little box right here? It says neutralize. Yeah. Watch this. What? Okay. So now I can play with my luminance and bring my luminance back. And I can tell it, you know what? I want a little more color in here, maybe. And yeah, that looks like hell at this point. But Interesting. Um, it's going to serve us well because we've gotten rid of that yellow color cast. And I've pumped up the colors in here, actually, so that hmm. I have more latitude now with the black and white adjustment layer, right? And I can mix these however I want. I can, you know, turn this down just a little bit like that. Hmm. Okay. And so this is going to be my starting point. All right, let's just kind of zoom in here a little bit. All right, so when you're monitoring your histogram in Photoshop, um, A, you need to look at the expanded view of the histogram. If you don't have that, just go up into this little pancake menu up here and choose expanded view, and then choose the, from the drop-down menu, RGB. Now, the histogram in Photoshop does not auto-generate like the one in Lightroom you need to refresh it. So when you see this little exclamation point here, just click on it and it will refresh. Yeah, so you can see that I've got some stuff over here on the right side, but that I know what that is. That's these light sources. So I'm not worried about that. So at this point, I'm gonna start my black and white conversion. So I'm first gonna click on a black and white adjustment layer. And then on top of that, I'm going to put a gradient map adjustment layer. So doesn't that look great? We're done, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> So I need to change the gradient here. So just by clicking on this gradient strip here and choosing black, white, and I'm going to get a nice representation mm -hmm. of black and white. So what this does is it takes the black and white or any shade of gray in between. It looks at the mm -hmm. luminance value and says, oh, this is you know 16. This should be something that's in zone one. It should be a value of 16 black and it just remaps it. But the cool thing is, is that if I click on this, I get the gradient editor. So, and by the way, there's, um, I, I'm giving Levi um, an article and a video that he can post that details this part of the process so that you can replicate this on your own. So awesome. this gradient here represents the tones in my image. These are my shadows. These are my highlights. And this little diamond here is, you guessed it, my midtones. I can move this around and I'm actually going to do that. I'm going to take this diamond. Now, you can see that I've got, you know, three separate cursors depending on where I park my mouse. So what you want is you got to get really close to the diamond and you want the arrow. If you get the finger, you're going to add another color stop and that's not what we want. So we want the, the and you're not going to see any changes while you're doing this. You have to let go because this is an old Photoshop adjustment. So my photo looks really dark now and that's okay because what I wanted to do is spread out my shadows so that I have some room to redistrib redistribute them. Is that that's a word? So you've you've increased you've increased the tonal range of the shadows by scooting that to the right. Exactly. I've given my shadows. I've allowed them to stretch out on the histogram. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'll get rid of my phone here. It's going off. So I'm going to click on this stop right here, and now I'm going to hold down my alter my option key and go about two thirds of the way between the diamond and this stop here. And I'm just gonna click. 
And Photoshop's going to create a color stop that's exactly the color uh, that sees in the gradient right above it. So now I've got my highlights over here and my shadows over here. And I've got a midpoint between both of them. So what I'm going to do is actually manipulate this. Actually, let's push this back down this way a little bit like that. And just say, you know what, that's kind of where I want my blacks to be. I'm going to click on my middle one again. Now I'm going to open my highlights up like that. And I can still move this around. I can make it darker. In this case, I want to go lighter. And now, not that much, maybe like that. And I want to give my blacks a little more muscle. So the thing that I get concerned about right now is you can see that I've got stuff that's totally black and I don't want to go there. There's no law in the universe that says that this color has to be absolute black. If I double click on this and bring up the color picker, now I'm going to change my hue and saturation values to zero. Otherwise, when I start to raise those blacks, they're going to start to turn blue and I don't want that. And I'm just going to highlight that number and hit my up arrow key a couple of times. And you can see what's happening, right? It's remapping my blacks to that color. So what I want is just like three or four, just so nothing is, you know, pure black. For a second there, I thought you were making a faded Instagram filter for us. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. Right? So that look, that's looking pretty good. So, you know, I think we'll go a little bit lighter here. Maybe, maybe back that off just, uh, maybe not, you know. So you can have fun with this. And this is real. You could see how much latitude you get here. And we haven't even touched the color yet. This is just tone. So let's accept that and say, okay. Now, now I could go up, go into my black and white um, adjustment layer. So I put the black and white adjustment layer below the gradient map because the black and white adjustment layer is still seeing color, right? The gradient map doesn't see it uh, doesn't give me the ability to manipulate that. It just has to do with tone. So the black and white adjustment layer is going to output black and white, and then the gradient map layer is going to remap whatever it's sent by the black and white adjustment layer. Does that make sense? Right. So now I have control over all my colors, right? Mm. Look, there's my yellows. So I can make my yellow. I can still do the same kind of mapping that I'm used to doing in... Lightroom and look at all the texture and stuff that we've been able to pull out of these walls because we're manipulating tone and color separately. So we can make that a little brighter and we'll pull that cyan, the blue back a little bit. And there's probably a little bit of magenta in here because it's not a landscape. So do I want that really bright? Probably not, yeah, maybe like that. So there we go, great starting point, right? Here's where we began, right here. And that's where we're at now. And we've got lots of texture and lots of nice tonal distribution in our darker midtones here because of the way we manipulated the gradient map. So now we can start to finish this photograph off. So the first thing I'll do is completely ruin it by <laughs> darkening it. What? So I'm gonna pull this down and I'm gonna pull this down even more. What? Trust me. And I'm gonna <laughs> click. I'm click a professional. On, click on my, yeah, trust me. I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to click on my black uh, point here and just do the same thing that I did in the gradient map adjustment. Just click, click, just to make sure that none of those blacks are going to black. Perfect. Now comes the fun part. This is the brush part. So if you don't have a Wacom tablet, get one. You're never going to go back. And the way to learn to use a Wacom tablet is to commit yourself to doing everything with it, including answering your email for two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. All right. Yeah, so I have good. some custom brushes set up for myself up here. And I've got a brush that's set to opacity um, when I'm using my tablet. So I'm going to paint it. But I'm going to increase the increase 30%. So 30% opacity. And I'm going to use a pretty big brush here. Now I can just start to bring back some of this light by painting on my mask with black, right? I'm just erasing that, erasing that, that darkening effect. So now we can just kind of start to light this up and just make some nice strokes in here and bring back some of this stuff that's fun. 
right? And maybe I want to splash a little bit of light up here. I can do that. A little there. I like some of this stuff up here. Let's bring our tree back. And I'm using a big brush. And I'm going to show you my mask here by holding down the Alt key and clicking on the mask. You can see how exact my brush strokes are. That's not very. So if you're using a big brush at low opacity, um, you're you're in pretty good shape as far as you know not worrying about oh my god you know it's not going to look right you're going to be able to see my brush strokes you won't um, if you build up gradually and if you uh, use a bigger brush um, my rule of thumb is always use as big of a brush as you can get away with because if you do that then no one can see your brush strokes all right so that's looking pretty good. Um, I'm going to refresh my histogram at this point, and I can see that I've still got plenty of room there. So I can go a couple different ways here, but I think what I really want to do is start to introduce, I, you know, I love glows. I just love them. So I'm going to make a stamp, and the keyboard shortcut for this, and it's not in any Photoshop menu anywhere, is Control, Shift, Option, E, or Control, Command, Option, Shift, E if you're on a Mac. So make a stamp. And that makes a copy of it. everything that's below it is baked into this. So I can mm. turn all this other stuff off and it won't matter, right? Yeah, it's like copy stamp visible or something like that. Merge. Yeah, and it's basically yeah, it's, it's, it's flattening without losing all the layers. Yeah. So filter, blur, and Gaussian blur. So what I want is maybe like a 35 or 40 pixel blur. But what I want is to be able to see the shapes, but not the detail, right? And I'm going to say, OK. And now I'm going to change the blend mode here to screen, which is a brightening blend mode. And we get this nice kind of glow. But I don't want yeah. that everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. So here's the power of blend if. If you double click on the layer here, just outside the um, outside the the thumbnail and outside the name of the layer, you're going to get the layer style dialog box. And that's blend if is down here. Once you start using blend if, you're going to use it on everything. I had somebody, one of my students say, you use blend if all the time. I use it for everything. I'm like, yes, it's because it's awesome. So what I want is to bring back some of the shadows from the underlying layer. So that's what this is. And these are the highlights from the underlying layer. These are the shadows from the layer that I'm on and the highlights from the layer that I'm on. It looks like we have two sliders for each, but it's actually four. If I hold down the Alt key, I can actually split this slider. That Alt key, man. Yeah, and introduce a nice fade, a gradual fade between my... So what's happening is my the effect is 100% at zero, and then it, it's at nothing at, at tonal value 53, and it's a gradual fade off. So I can just kind of fade this off like that and say, okay, and now it's a little bit too much. So I can just back this off a touch like that. And we get a nice, you know, nice glow happening here. So I'm gonna back up for a second and turn this layer off. And I'm gonna introduce another curves adjustment. I just changed my mind on something. <laughs> and I wanna darken this whole thing again like this, okay? And now I'm just going to use my mouse. I'm going to get on the, park myself on the, and about 40%. And I'm just going to kind of do this and just really bring back those, only those areas that I want. My computers, my keyboard shortcuts are going nuts because I swear to God, I know what I'm doing. It's always hard when you're streaming and working okay. at the same time. Right. So, I like that. We've kind of created a little bit of a vignette here. And we'll do another one in a minute because there's no law that says you can only have one vignette, right? Sure. So let's get rid of that and do it again. So we'll make a stamp, Control Alt, Control Alt Shift E, and go back to my blur. I'm going to use the same blur. If you use a filter, and the filter that you used last with its settings appears first in the filter menu. So you can hmm. skip the dialog box. And now I'll change this. I'm actually going to change this to linear dodge add, which is brighter than screen. Now linear dodge add is one of the Photoshop special eight blend modes and it's controlled not by the opacity slider, 
It's controlled by the fill slider. Uh, so that looks pretty good. Jim, what, and, what does fill mean? So it's a mathematical. I knew you were going to ask me that. Darn <laughs> you, you ruined my day. Um, uh, we, we'll just edit this part out. Never mind. So opacity, <laughs> <laughs> opacity um, governs the, uh, the visibility of the entire effect at 100%. OK, so if you turn the opacity down to 50 percent, the effect is still applied fully at 100 percent, but you only see half of it. Right. The fill, the fill slider actually allows you to say to, to say, you know what, I want to see this um, this effect at full volume, but I want to actually turn. It's like a preamp almost. I want to turn. I only want to see it at 50 percent of the effect but i want to see it at full opacity i know that's confusing and it is confusing okay so, so it's it's making less effect instead of just reducing the visibility of the effect correct thank you that's a great way of saying it yes okay that's yeah, cool it's I, like, it's I like the difference between an amp and a preamp right no that doesn't so, make any sense to me at all we got this nice glow going on now. I love glows. And um, if we want to, we can make an, a nice vignette. So who loves, you guys like vignettes? Yeah, yeah like a, a, like a, a well-made vignette is, is yeah. a wonderful tool. Right. Uh, but I hate vignettes that look like vignettes. Right. Exactly. So I, I don't know. I always make my own. So I've got the lasso tool and I'll just make a nice organic shape here. And it almost doesn't matter what shape you make because you can edit this afterwards. And then just put it on a curve. And I want the outer edges to be darkened, so I have to invert my mask, Controller Command I. And now I need to blur it because I need a feather on my mask, right? I need a feather on my. Um, so this, in this case, we need like you know 450 pixels or something. It's got to be a big radius on here, and you can see what happens to my mask. So now I can pull this down, and I get this nice vignette here. But the great thing about doing it this way is that I can grab a brush now and say, you know what, I'm going to paint with white. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to paint with black. And I want to bring some of this corner back because it's out of hand. So 20%, right? And we can just kind of ease this vignette in so it doesn't look so fake. Mm, and if, yeah, I that want, looks good. if I want more of it, I can just flip my color and say, you know what, I want a little bit there. I want a little there like that. And I want to get my black brush again. And I want to erase up in here because I like the way that light looks. Yeah. And so there you have it. So a nice nighttime Christmas scene from Kansas City where it was freezing. Oh, okay. Yeah, right on. It really, yeah, it, that was, that came a long way from that starting color image. Right, so that's where we were. And, yeah. you know, so this is really about, you know, visualizing the shot when you're taking it. I know what direction I want to go with this. I could see this in my head before I ever shot it. And that's, yeah. a, you know, part of that is experience. But um, you have to consciously want to do that. So, OK, so let's move on to the there, next one. There's a oh. question um, before we move on. I think someone maybe hit, even answered it in the comments. But the question from Susan is, do you recommend using the gradient map first, then the black and white adjustment? Um, someone else uh, have chimed in. If you do that, the um, the black and white adjustment is not going to have any effect yeah. because the black and white adjustment layer is looking for color. And if you put a gradient map on first, you've taken all the color out and um, it's going not nothing's going to happen. And I can just demonstrate that for you really quick. So what we'll do is we'll put the gradient map down first and I'm just going to switch. I'm not going to manipulate anything. All right. So we got black and white. And now I'm going to put a black and white adjustment layer on top of that, and I can move these sliders all day and nothing happens because yes, it's looking for color. Gotcha. Any other uh, questions there, Rob? Uh, that was that was it. Someone, uh, I think Hartong Digital Media chimed in and said black and white adjustment needs to be below the gradient map. So. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, is this the only method, Terry's asking, is this the only method for introducing a glow into your image using the Gaussian blur that way? Uh, it's my favorite. <laughs> um, there's sometimes I'll, I'll use plugins to do that, but I like to do it this way. Um, sometimes I'll actually make the shadows glow. 
So what I'll do is instead of changing the blend mode to multiply or uh, screen, I'll change it to multiply because I like sometimes those really velvety blacks, right? Wow. So I think uh, we better have an episode just on blend modes with you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> hey, okay, that's fine. All right, so let's open the next image. Uh, let's do let's do this one. Uh, yeah. Well, let's open it, Jim. I have a question. Where where do yeah. you fall on adding grain into a black and white? I do it all the time. I love I love to add grain, yeah. and I usually tone my photos as well. So, okay. if I wanted to do that on this photo, I would probably um, I actually have uh, in my curves adjustment tool here. Where is it at? There it is. I actually have a preset, I think, in here. I think I love, I don't, all my presets aren't on here yet because this is a brand new computer. Uh, and it is not, but let's say I wanted to do silver. Um, I would probably add, you know, a little bit of cyan to this. Like so, and I'm going to overdo it and probably a little bit of blue. Like that. And then just turn the opacity down. I'll probably change this to color. What is that? Uh, my color. And then just turn <laughs> that down. Let's turn that down a little bit so it's nice. And then for grain, yeah. um, Silver FX Pro has a great grain generator. Uh, Photo Raw has a great grain generator. Um, I also use sometimes a, pl a plugin called Imaginomic uh, Real Grain, okay. which has yep. a great grain generator. Um, the new grain generator in Photo Raw is pretty darn good. So yeah. you might want to take a look at that. Which so, is yeah, also I, in Lightroom. Just remember, folks, it's also the same tool in Lightroom. Yes, exactly. So yeah, uh, I, I think I love grain. Yes. Yeah. Long answer to a short question. Sorry. No, it was good. I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. That's good. All right. Hey, so, and, uh, yeah. uh, sorry, sorry, real quick, Jim. As we, as we wind up the hour here, we've had a lot of great comments here. And an if anyone right else, now. yeah. If anyone else would like to leave us a comment or ask a question of Jim, that enters you in the drawing for Perfectly Clear Complete Version 3, which is a really powerful tool for preparing your pictures for uh, black and white. And we think you'd like it. And then also head over to photofocus.com and uh, enter yourself in the drawing for a 30 by 40 inch acrylic print with with true life acrylic on it and it's a it's a great little drawing we've got with i think there's, there's like 800 dollars worth of prizes in there so nice. leave us a comment here and enter yourself on photofocus.com all right so i'm going to win the print so <laughs> so nobody else enter yeah I'm just leave it at that. I, I really want to see one of those i'm telling you so, so uh, Terry, how are we doing on time? Do you want to, what do you want to do? Well, um, what do you think, Rob? Yeah. Well, we got about six minutes. Um, and Terry is asking, can you do that sort of black and white conversion in Lightroom or is it just for Photoshop? Well, the, the, the gradient map stuff that Jim was just showing, that's obviously all in Photoshop. Um, but you can do in either Lightroom or Camera Raw a, a black and white conversion um you just won't have the tools you know that jim's been showing kind of that like, gives you a lot more control um in a lot of different ways and and actually also head in terry we've got several episodes of black and white i mean rob and i have been doing this is our fourth year doing this uh webinar every month and we've got several episodes in the can on black and white conversions using um lightroom and some other tools. So head head yeah. back in our viewer, in, you know, in our YouTube page and check those out. So, you know, if, go ahead, Jim, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say that, uh, you know, you can, you can do black and white conversions in just about any good photo editing software. Um, what makes a good black and white conversion is not the tool. Mm -hmm. What makes a good black and white version is the the photographer and the editor and that person's vision for their photograph. That's mm -hmm. what makes a good black and white. So, you know, I would say whatever tool you use, master the tool, learn it inside and out and upside down, 
because after a while, it becomes second nature to you. Um, we've all seen, you know, people like Stevie Ray Vaughan play guitar, right? When he was playing, he, he wasn't standing up there thinking, gee, I'm playing a B minor scale. So he had mastered his tool and become one with it, and he was able to express himself. So any tool is going to do the job. Don't go on a software search looking for the best thing, because the best thing is your brain. Awesome. Thank you. I left you guys speechless. Unbelievable. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and sometimes, you know, the, you've got to use more than one tool, which I'll just say. Too. Absolutely. No I mean, question about uh, it. Um, depending on, you know, where you want to go. And so like that, that glow effect that you were just showing, I can't think of a way to do that in Lightroom alone. I, just I've like got a, you couldn't. There, there's a little bit of glow you can get in Lightroom using the dehaze tool. Yep, you can. If you add haze instead of dehaze, you can get a little yeah. And then if you use the <laughs> new luminosity masking feature and, you know, um, isolate mm. it into the midtones and the highlights. Oh, I like that. And I guess you could use it, yeah, using it in like a local adjustment. Absolutely. Um, so Lightroom, you I still would, I still would go to Photoshop. <laughs> I would still go to Photoshop <laughs> myself. As much as I love Lightroom, I probably, for that, I would still go. Well, the thing is, you know, when it comes to doing that kind of brushing, you know, I have a walk-in tablet as well. And, and it works in Lightroom. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't have the same level of control in the brush uh, in Lightroom. I mean, in Lightroom as you do in Photoshop. So, That's true. Um, you know, and for... a question about that, and you also don't have, you know, this, uh, this brush panel here, which, yeah. uh, where is it? Somewhere over here, where you can build your custom brushes and you can make them do whatever you want. Right. And that's the power of the brushing tool in Photoshop. And the new brush palette in Photoshop is pretty awesome because they gave us now the ability finally to organize our brushes and folders and so it's right. really easy to use. Yeah. And for me, I, 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 sometimes I don't even distinguish between using Lightroom and Photoshop because they just feel like one continuous tool for me where I start in right. Lightroom. If there's something I need to do, I just shoot it over to Photoshop, do whatever I do there, and I'm right back in Lightroom. And I, you know, I don't, I don't even think about it as a separate thing. But. Why? Well, and they really are meant to be used together, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Definitely. So, well, you know, Photoshop just takes things a little bit further, but you can do great black and white conversions in Lightroom. No question about yeah. it. Um, well, we're kind of at the end of our hour. Um, is there any kind of like one, you know, thing you wanted to make sure we got across before we? Pull winners out of Levi's hat. You're gonna you're gonna do the winners live. Yes, you got to be. Awesome. We do it live. The winner has to actually be here and chime in to say mm -hmm. that they um, they're here. So, yes. Uh, so I would just say that you know black and white requires um, a different kind of mindset. But it's anybody who grew up watching black and white television, uh, old black <laughs> and white movies, you have that aesthetic already hard baked into you. Right. Yeah. It's already there. You just need to figure out how to express it. And uh, anybody who heads over to my website, you can see that I have a, a, a black and white course on there. If you're interested in that, you can click on that or send me an email. And, um, you know, I'm happy to answer anybody's questions. If you want to send me off an email, uh, every email that I get gets an answer, regardless of you know, it might take me a couple of days. But um, so black and white, I, I just think black and white has soul that color photography doesn't have and already by stripping the color out you're stepping away from reality so that gives you a lot of creative freedom that you don't have when you're working in color so yeah. well there's a timelessness with a black and white no question that like with that color shop you had you know you can probably figure out you know the, the era the, the the year when when that was when something's black and white like this that like that could have been that could have been a hundred years ago. I mean, well, it, it looks it ends up looking more like the time the building was made, you know, with right. the, with this kind of architecture and things that that whether it's a new building or not, it's reminiscent of a time of affluence in our country, and and building a grand kind of train station right. reminds us of of a of, of a specific. Yeah. of a particular time in our in our history and yeah. and, and, and it would have been a time when black and white was the the tool for recording it yeah i mean that's a, for a long time that was the way we saw the world through media mm -hmm. right it was black and white black and white photography black and white tv 
um, and look at the drama that you can create with just a brush and you know some levels adjustments that uh, yeah. and it, it's all about that contrast so i i i'm a black and white evangelist i admit it and and uh, <laughs> me too you know, yeah so <laughs> Well, I, what do I want to say to people about black and white? You got a couple more hours because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we might just have to have you back, Jim. You know, I um, I dove into your YouTube channel a bit over the weekend just to kind of get up up, up to speed on stuff. And uh, okay. I, you got a lot of great content on there. So for anyone who's feeling like energized and they, they want more, just head right over there. You can just pick up same voice and you will you can just continue on uh, the journey if you're gonna do that i would say start with the uh there's two videos on learning how to see in black and white and and uh that lays the foundation for the whole thing oh, so perfect. Out. excellent well excellent. levi you want to pick it pick a winner yes i've got two winners i've got uh terry dashfield wins one of our perfectly clear complete licenses as well as hartong digital media and what do they do LLC. They just need to send me an email. Before Levi they do that, photo focus. Well, before they do that, they should say, "I'm here," which in, in they were the just saying. So yeah. Terry, actually chime in again for real. Let me know you got her. Okay, <laughs> you got her. <laughs> um, and, and Hartog as well. So, uh, awesome. um, thanks, guys, for everybody for tuning in and and for leaving comments and asking questions. It helps us make sure we're we're. Uh, yeah, it was really. Right. interactive group so yes yeah. so so jim so people we know your website is we know you're gonna you're gonna be at uh out of chicago and, and jim why don't you stop screen sharing for a sec there too okay <laughs> um yeah that'd be a good thing we can see your there face. I am. um so i am i'm going to be in um olympic national park in may with uh with blake brutus doing a workshop there we still oh, have nice. a couple of spots left um so if you're Washington, in Washington, right? Out, yeah, Washington. Washington so Blake and I are going to be uh, doing the, um, our creative mechanic series there where we're kind of Blake goes in his creative direction and I go in mine. Then we come together at the end and uh, not shooting wise, processing wise and, and uh -huh. the differences and, and the strengths of each. Um, and then in October, uh, I'll be going back to Scotland for a couple of weeks to do a workshop there. Wow. In the fall. Yeah. So Scotland, let me tell you, I was there in June. It is, it's everything that you expect and more. Oh, it's man. pretty historic. It's jaw droppingly beautiful. So, so I was hiking this morning and as I'm hiking around, I'm like, man, I am in the Scottish Highlands right now. You got to come out here, Jim. The spot that I'm in, it's incredible. But where you at? Uh, in Idaho. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I totally, I totally want to come see the actual Highlands. It's yeah, it's As so well. gorgeous. It's not even funny. And those castles out there, you would think they'd be big tourist attractions, and they're not. They're just kind of sitting there. Really? So, yeah. So you get the whole place to yourself, really. Right on. You, know, you pull up, maybe two other cars there, and you know, ten photographers, twelve photographers get out, and you got the whole place to yourself. It's awesome. Sounds so, great. I'm so, there. Um, yeah. So those are the two <laughs> big things. Um, the, the, hey, while you're big. in, uh, when you're in Olympic, you got to look up our last monochrome guest, Daniel Gregory. His, oh, right. his yeah. studio is just right outside there. Do you know Daniel? I do not, but um, um, yeah, he's in contact. He's terrific. Him. He's got a. You have a lot to talk about. <laughs> um, I'm yeah. looking forward to that Olympic workshop because uh, I'm I'm I love the ocean and mm -hmm. I'm so fired up about shooting those those seascapes and uh, we're going to do a few of them. So it's going to be awesome, including one night shot with the Milky Way. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, you got to keep your eye out for some of the. The wildlife in that area is, is pretty remarkable as well. The the biggest elk in the world live in that area. That's that's a scary thought because elk it, are, elk are yeah. already big. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're really big. So uh, so that kind of stuff is uh, an eagles galore up there. I mean, it's gonna it's gonna be quite a trip. Oh man! All right, yeah. And we're we're and we're going in May when the uh, uh, all the streams will be full because the snow yeah. melt will be coming down off the mountain. So all those waterfalls will be all lit up. It's going to be great. Yeah. Come on along. All right, Levi, where can we find you? Uh, you can catch me on uh, photofocus.com, of course. I will be at, where am I going? I'm going to the SHOT Show, which is a new experience for me in Vegas later this month. I'm going to WPPI 
I'm going to capture Con in Phoenix, which is another another up and coming little conference. Um, I think I'll probably be at Photoshop World. Is that in April? May. It's in May. It's okay, yeah. May. Which which also is Capture Con. Um, and uh, and then I'll be at out of Chicago. And if you're in Idaho, come on by. Let's go shoot something. <laughs> I'd love to get back to Idaho. <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm going to have to come out because, um, although you know, you should, you'd have to prepare your wife because if if I come out, I don't sleep, I shoot, and that's it. I'm like, I get sleep. No, no, when I I, get I'm home. right there with you, man. I was, I was <laughs> out the door before my wife was in bed. It seemed like this morning. So, <laughs> yeah, um, right. I just feel like I can sleep when I get home. I d- I shot exactly. as long as I could. Uh, and when we were in Scotland in June, the sun didn't go down till eleven at night. Oh man, yeah. Yeah, that's that's how it is here. Yeah. Um, not quite that, not quite that late. It's like ten. It's after ten o'clock when it's setting up here. That's nice. um, and that's how it'll be for you in the, in Washington too. But um, yeah, come on out, man. Uh, Brian Essler from out of Chicago is coming out right before WPPI, and we're caravanning down to Vegas. Well, fun. So, Are you really? You're going to Vegas yeah. with Brian? Uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> come on, come join us, man. It'll be fun. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, Jim, thanks so much for hanging out with us for this hour and sharing all that and uh, tapping us into your YouTube channel. It's a lot of great stuff on there. So, Rob, did you tell us where we can catch you? Uh, Photo Focus. Uh, I, do a, I do a weekly Lightroom thing on Lightroom Killer Chips these days. So stuff over there. I've got a good thing on YouTube. Um, I'll be at Photoshop World, and um, that's probably it. I'll be in the short term. And, uh, right cool on. Local stuff. My semester starts next next week, so good. Winter breaks over. <laughs> next time, um, right yeah. On. So that's it. So thanks everyone for joining us for our January uh, hangout, and uh, we'll see ya. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. All right. Take care.